Amen. Romans chapter 8, verses 28, that's it, Boogie. 28 through 31. You and what army? And the word of the Lord today reads from the King James text. And we know, the Apostle Paul says to the church at Rome, <clears throat> that all things work together for good, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, <clears throat> for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say, then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. You and what army? If you'll bow your heads with me in prayer for a moment. Master, Savior, King, we love you, Jesus. And we thank you, God, for the word of the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this incredible, miraculous, powerful text which puts in our hands the very words of our God. Master, it helps us to know what pleases you. It helps us to understand what displeases you. It helps us to know how to live the best life how to walk in divine blessing, how to walk in divine favor. Master, today, more importantly than this, it helps us to know what we must do if we would secure a place in heaven, a place at your side for all of eternity. For you have gone to enormous lengths to provide a means of salvation for lost mankind. You provided a gospel message. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And Master, today we love the Word of God. We do not fear the Word of God. The Word of God does not make us anxious. We love the Word of God, and we strive and we struggle to live according to its precepts, to honor it, Lord, in our daily living, not that we might make heaven, for grace is the means whereby we will make heaven. But we do so, Lord, that we might be a profitable servant, one who has lived their life in such a way as to be a light in a dark world, as to be salt, a preservative in a world that is dying and decaying in sin, as a means, Lord, of being a testimony and a witness to lost mankind, that they might too find their way to this wonderful Savior, that they too might find their way to the foot of the cross, that they too, Lord, might receive the benefit and the blessing of their sin being washed away by the blood of the Lamb through the power of Jesus' name by the fire of the Holy Ghost. Master, today anoint the preacher of the gospel Help me, Lord, to deliver this word that you placed in my heart for the people of God. Touch every ear, Lord, that would hear today. Let every heart be receptive. Let it be prepared by the Holy Ghost 
not only to hear, but to receive and to benefit from that which is preached. We ask it all and none other than the wonderful saving name, Jesus, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, in the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel, in the 17th chapter, there is a story that most of us, doesn't even matter if you grew up in church or not, there's a story that most of us are very, very familiar with. It is the story of David and Goliath. Even if you never graced a Sunday school class, even if you grew up going to uh, a temple or going to a synagogue or going to a mosque, the likelihood is that you have heard, you are familiar with the story of David and Goliath. David was just a little farmhand. He was a young man, the youngest of his brothers. He tended to his father's flocks as a shepherd. But daddy called him in one day and asked him to go to the front lines where his brothers were fighting with King Saul against the armies of, Philistine, of Philistines. And he was to bring some supplies, a care package, if you will, to his brothers on the front lines. When David arrived at the front lines, he found the king and the soldiers of Israel uh, just bent over in fear, hiding out in their camp. They said, the Philistines have put forth a giant, a man who is much larger and stronger and more powerful than any one man that we have in all the armies of Israel. And this giant has sent out a uh, challenge to us saying, send me a man and I'll fight against your one man. And if he wins, you'll serve us. And you'll be enslaved to us, but if we win, then, you'll, uh, then we'll serve you and we'll be enslaved to you. Well, the biggest mistake that the Israelites made was letting the devil determine the rules of battle. Number one, don't you ever let the devil determine the rules of battle. Don't you ever let the enemy determine the rules of battle. Honey, the devil don't tell me how I'm going to fight. How many times have you been involved in a spiritual battle, a spiritual warfare, and somebody comes along and says, well, if you're a child of God, this is how you ought to do this thing. Um, excuse me, honey, the devil don't tell me how to fight. Amen. Don't you ever let the enemy tell you how to fight the battle. But what's interesting is when David heard the challenge that Goliath had put forth, David said, who does this giant think he is? Who does he think he is to come against the armies of Israel? The armies of Israel represent the God of Israel. Don't you know that this isn't our battle? This is God's battle. And God had never lost a battle one day in eternity. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh my, David had a different way of looking at this situation. I want to tell you today, I talk a lot about... The necessity of believers to rely upon the grace of God. I talk a lot about the fact that our salvation is not earned. Our salvation is a gift from God in response to our faith. I talk a lot about the fact that things that come into our lives do not come into, their, into our lives of their own accord, but they are allowed or permitted, sometimes even initiated, by the Lord Himself. Therefore, nothing comes your way except that Satan, as in the story of Job, Satan first had to stand before God 
and get approval. You see, everything that happened to Job, God permitted. The Word of God said that God took down the hedge that was around Job. The Word of God tells us that the angels of God encamp round about them that fear him. So therefore, in order for Job to even be accessible to the enemy, God had to call some of his angels off. <sighs> he said, devil, I got news for you. I know my man. And it don't matter what you throw at him, everything you throw at him, he's going to stay my man. Amen. He is going to continue to be faithful to me, to be committed to me. His faith will never fail because in the end, it is your faith that the enemy is trying to rob you of. It's not about the enemy trying to make you do something bad, make you do something wicked, make you do something evil. Say, well, but does the enemy try to encourage you to do these things? Yes, he does. But why does he do that? It's not because if you do it, you're going to immediately, that very instant, go to hell over it. Uh-uh. It's because... Look at the story of Judas. Judas betrayed the Lord. But before the life of Judas had ended, he had gone to the temple, returned to the high priest and to his minions, the 30 pieces of silver that had been given him for the head of Jesus, for betraying the Lord Jesus Christ. He had returned that money. He said, I don't want this. This money has blood on it. I don't want this. He had returned it. Not only had Judas repented in his heart, but he had done what the Word of God calls, he had brought forth meat under repentance. He had done something that indicated his repentance was sincere. Yet... The Word of God tells us that Judas could never find a place of forgiveness. Even though he sought it, the Scripture says, with tears. Why? Because God would not forgive him? No. No. Because Judas could not forgive himself. And that's why Judas went and hanged himself and committed suicide because he could not forgive himself for what he had done. You see, the devil knows if I can inspire a child of God to go out today and do something entirely stupid, entirely wicked or evil or sinful or ungodly, they're going to come under such a pile of guilt because I'm going to make sure I pile the guilt on them. And they're going to come under such a weight of guilt and condemnation that they'll never be able to overcome that and they will surrender their faith. They'll give up on their faith. Because after all, what is your faith? What are you believing by reason of your faith? You're believing in the grace of God. You're believing that it's not your righteousness that's going to get you into heaven, but the righteousness of Christ. Am I telling the truth? I've got to take my jacket off. I'm getting a little warm today. So the enemy knows that if he can cause you to surrender your faith because of something he gets you to do. This is why I've preached messages on get up, dust off, move on. Remember? Amen. Just because you fail today, that doesn't mean nothing. Just get up, dust off, and move on. Honey, tomorrow's another day. Hallelujah. The Word of God promises if we sin, all we have to do is confess our sin. And the Scripture says, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh, but pastor, you don't know the condemnation I've been under. Got news for you, honey. Condemnation don't come from God. 
The word of God said, there is therefore now no condemnation, no condemnation, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. If you're fear feeling guilty about something, if your conscience is pricking you over something, then I've got news for you, honey. You're trying to walk after your spirit. You're trying to follow what you know to be right in your spirit. You're trying to do right by God. Am I telling the truth? If you weren't, then your conscience would not bother you. What many people call conviction from the Holy Ghost is in reality nothing more than our conscience troubling us. And the scripture said in the last days, there'd be some people calling themselves believers who would get so off base and so whacked out on wrong doctrine and wrong belief and wrong thinking that they would have their conscience seared with a hot iron. Meaning it'd be cauterized. That there would no longer be nerve endings that could even be reached or touched. That would cause the believer any trouble. How many believers in America today are so caught up in a geopolitical message. That they've lost any sight of a true spiritual Christianity. And they literally, Tommy, have become numb. There, there is no conscience anymore. They will cheer on murderers. They will cheer on people who are going into the Capitol, murdering police officers, who are tearing down things and destroying things. None of this is anything God would ever in a million years agree with. None of this is anything God would say is okay. But how many Christians sat there and said, Yeah, go! Go, you do it! You do it! Bless God, right? That's the right thing to do. We need to take this country back by force. Oh, really? That's not even close to the message of God's Word. So I don't know where in the world you come up with that cockamamie, idiotic mindset that this is acceptable. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. But they've had their conscience seared with a hot iron. What we often refer to as, as conviction, my friend, is not at all conviction. Conviction is when you believe something strong enough that you just cannot convince yourself to go against it. That is conviction. When your heart is condemning you, the scripture says, that is conscience. As long as your conscience is active, i got news for you, you're in good standing with God. Hallelujah. Did you hear me now? As long as your conscience is engaged, you're in good standing with God because that means that your heart is telling you one thing in spite of what you may have done, in spite of what you may have said, in spite of where you may have gone. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? So as long as your conscience is still working, hallelujah, thank God for it. And don't let the devil bring condemnation upon you because there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. I talk a lot about grace. I talk a lot about getting our mindset correct when it comes to works of righteousness or righteous action, righteous conduct, godly living, holiness. And how that these things are not about earning a place in heaven. These things are about being a witness, being a testimony, being the light that we're called to be, being the salt that we're called to be, being the candle on a candlestick that is not under a bushel. Am I telling the truth? That's what living right, living godly, living holy is all about. Being a profitable servant so when the master returns we can give him back more than he initially gave us. But does that mean when I talk about Everything that comes our way, God has had to approve and God has had to allow. All things work together, Paul said in our primary text today. All things work together for good to them of God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. 
We talk about this, but does that mean that the enemy never comes against us? No, no that's not at all what I'm saying. God must approve that the enemy must get approval. But, honey, he come against Job. You better believe as a child of God, the enemy's going to come against you. There is such a thing as spiritual warfare. In this spiritual warfare, what kills me about so many people in the church today is that Christians have no idea who the God they serve is. They have no clue of their inheritance as a born-again, spirit-filled child of God. They have no idea the power and the authority that God has laid at their feet. What is available to them? We have a deliverance ministry website. And I'm constantly contacted by people. And I've got to tell you, I, I don't mean to sound mean or anything. Sometimes I know I come across wrong. And I don't mean it necessarily the way I say it. But it comes out the way it comes out. I get sick and tired of hearing from people. Oh, brother, I'm cursed. Somebody's cursed me. I've got somebody trying to use witchcraft against me. I've got this. Oh, brother, oh, yeah, I need deliverance from this. I need deliverance from that. I need deliverance. I need deliverance. They have no idea what they're talking about. They literally have no clue. These are people who claim to be born again, spirit-filled people, and they have no idea what they're talking about. Deliverance is when the enemy has made an effort to get a foothold in our life. Listen to me now, children. And we have given him permission to do so. See, until we give the enemy permission, there is no such thing as Satan possessing someone or there is no such thing as demonic influence in somebody's life that has not been granted permission and access to be there. If you're fighting something, you don't need deliverance, you need right teaching. You hear what I'm telling you? If you're fighting something, you do not need deliverance. You need to be taught right to know who the God you serve is and what he's made available to us and what the cross of Calvary purchased in your name. Hallelujah to God. People always, I need deliverance. I need, no, you don't need deliverance. You need to get some right teaching. Which is why I encourage people who contact me, you need to come to church. You need to come to church. You know why? Because I guarantee you they'll come to our church a couple of weeks or a month or so, and all of a sudden that issue they've been fighting, they won't be fighting anymore. Why? Because they will have achieved deliverance? No, because they will have gotten enough right teaching in their spirit that they will get victory over that by themselves. They don't need anybody casting out demons. They don't have a demon. They may be wrestling with a demon, but they do not have a demon. Oh my goodness. The story of David and Goliath is a wonderful example of spiritual warfare. The word of God said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Our battle today is not against the Philistines. No, that is a type, that is a shadow of New Testament spiritual warfare. Oh, but there's a lesson to be learned in the story of David and Goliath. David found some stones. He knew how to use the sling. That was the only weapon that little boy was strong enough to handle. 
a slingshot, but I've used slingshots to scare off bears. I've used slingshots to scare off wolves and lions that try to come down and get my father's sheep. He said, I know how to use a slingshot. Just give me some stones. You don't need special equipment. You don't need holy water. You don't need, uh, you know, uh, all these accoutrements that these fools on these paranormal TV shows tell you that you need. You don't need salt. No, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The spiritual weapons that God has given us are capable of bringing down the strongholds, not just the weak areas of the enemy's camp, but the strong areas of the enemy's camp. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory to God! But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's not holy water. It's not salt. It's not, what's that other garbage Amy uses? Black water and black this, that. You know, uh, honey, that is all, those are all tools of the occult. And you better be careful if you start putting your confidence in those things. No, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. I can do all things. How? Through Christ, what does he do? That strengtheneth me. David taught us a lesson about spiritual warfare. He got his slingshot. He just used the only weapon he had at his disposal. There's only one substance the Word of God calls the church to use in prayer or in any form of spiritual battle or spiritual warfare. One. And that is, we anoint with olive oil. Olive oil is the only substance anywhere in Scripture. You'll never read about holy water. You'll never read about the sign of the cross. You'll never read about crucifixes. You'll never read about statues of the Virgin Mary. You'll never read about all this garbage. All those things, folks, are man-made. They're carnal. They're not spiritual. They're carnal. They're religious, but there's a difference between religious and spiritual, which is why how many people you watch these ghost hunting shows how many people say well I thought maybe putting up religious objects I thought maybe putting up crosses or putting up crucifixes would solve our problem but it didn't well of course it didn't because you're trying to fight the devil with religion and the devil ain't afraid of religion he's afraid of spirituality he's afraid of people who know who they are in the authority of the Holy Ghost through the power of Jesus' name. Those are the people that enemy is afraid of. Well, David, he got his olive oil, let's say. He got his scriptures because the word of God is the only other weapon we wield, isn't it? He grabbed his... A lot of people don't realize, but there is significance in the fact that David picked up five stones... Because in David's day, the Jewish people had what is referred to today as the Pentateuch, the Law of Moses, and that was their scripture. Well, there are five books in the Law of Moses, therefore the number five is of great significance to Old Testament Judaism. That is why the old, if you listen to a rabbi teach about uh, David and Goliath, he'll tell you that the five stones represent the word of God. They represent the law of Moses. So David took the word. He went out with his little slingshot. He stood in front of that big old giant and the giant was insulted that they would even send a little boy like David out to fight against him. Why they didn't even appear. Look at my display up there today, my illustration. They didn't even send somebody that appeared to be remotely worthy 
of opposing and standing in opposition to the great man Goliath. Goliath, according to Scripture, was probably close to or about nine feet tall. So he was a very tall. We've never seen a human being nine feet tall. I think about the tallest we've ever seen in recent uh, centuries is, is about eight feet tall. So Goliath was awful tall. But I'm going to tell you, the enemy can look as big as he wants to look. He can look as scary as he wants to look. He can look as strong as he wants to look. But when a child of God understands who they are, and when they understand whose they are, he can look the enemy in the eye. Little David can look at Goliath and say, You think you're going to take us out? You and what army? What are you talking about me and what army? I don't need an army. I don't need anybody behind me. I can do it all by myself. Oh, do you think you can? You see, Mr. Goliath, let me tell you a little secret. You come out here for a big man, for a strong man, for somebody who's trying to be so intimidating. You come out here against me, little old tiny me, with sword and spear and with a shield bearer in front of you. <laughs> said, but I've come in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Woo! David knew where his power lied. He knew where his power came from. He said, my help cometh from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Hallelujah to God. said, I got news for you, Goliath. You may be big, you may be strong, you may have all kinds of armor and all kinds of weapons, but I have something behind me that you haven't got behind you. I've got the name of Jesus. I've got the power of God, and it's going to take you and what are to try to bring us down. Hallelujah. When you know who you are, as a child of God, every spirit that comes against you, when jealousy, rage, envy, strife, confusion comes against you and is trying to find an opening into your life, you'll be able to look at that demon and say, devil, you and what army think you're going to get a foothold in my life? Because I got news for you, baby. It's going to take a whole lot more than you. Go get as many friends as you've got, and you still won't have enough. One of the biggest mistakes that Christians make, and I've heard it in Pentecostal churches, this is crap. Yeah, I said crap. This is crap that you ought to hear in Catholic churches and Episcopal churches. But honey, you should never hear it off the lips of a Pentecostal, Holy Ghost filled, tongue talking, Jesus name baptized believer. Well, don't you know, one third of the angels fell with the devil. But that means two-thirds stayed with God. So for every devil coming against us, there's two angels working for us. Honey, I don't need no angels working for me. I've got God on my side. As long as I've got God on my side, I've got all I need. The angels work for him. But as long as I've got God on my side, it doesn't matter whether there's two angels to one demon or 10,000 angels to one demon, one God to every devil, and they still have to find an army. Hallelujah! Because the Word of God declares today in our primary text, if God be for us, who can be against us? What shall we say then, then say to these things? If God be for us, who 
can be against us. Hallelujah. It's not about whether or not Michael the Archangel, you people running around praying the St. Michael prayer. Honey, asking St. Michael to help you only shows that you don't have a clue who Jesus is. Asking St. Michael to help you only shows that you have no idea who God is. Because as long as you've got God on your side, you don't need a saint. As long as you've got God on your side, you don't need an angel. Right. If God be for us, who can be against us? The enemy comes wanting to tear down your faith. Look him in the eye and say, you and what army? Jesus said in John 10, 27 through 30, my sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, meaning the Spirit versus the flesh, the person of Jesus, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Ain't no man able to pluck you out of the Lord's hand. <laughs> you and one army. Want to come against my faith? You're going to try to get me to forfeit my faith in God, to forfeit my faith in the gospel? You and what army? Because according to my Bible, nobody is able to pluck me out of God's hand. In Matthew 10, 28 through 31, Jesus said, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. But rather, right there, folks, let me clear something up for you. There's false teaching out there that tries to tell you that the soul and the body are one and the same. Wrong. Because Jesus said, don't worry about them that can cure, kill the body, but they cannot kill the soul. So obviously the body and the soul are not one and the same. Let's clear that up right away. Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy the both soul and body in hell are not two sparrows sold for a farthing. And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. Yeah, devil, you and what army? Every hair on my head is numbered. I'm of far more value to God than many sparrows. I ain't got nothing to fear. Hallelujah. There ain't nothing you can do to me. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. The word of God said in Luke chapter 10, verses 18 through 20, Jesus is speaking. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions. And over all the power, all the power, all the power of the enemy. And nothing, nothing. That means no exceptions. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you. Oh children are you listening to the words of Jesus? That the spirits are subject unto you. That the spirits are subject unto you. You're not subject unto them. They are subject unto you. He's given you all power over all the enemy. <clears throat> well, I'm going to tell you, when you understand this thing right, 
Suddenly the devil looks like a little midgeted bug. And you can squish him with your thumb. He said in verse 20, Luke 10, Notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Devil, you and what army? My God has given me power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. He's given me power over all of your power, de power devil. You and what army are going to take me out? Matthew 17, 14 through 20. And when they were come to the multitude... There came to him a certain man kneeling down to him, to Jesus, and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falleth into the fire and off into the water. And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? He said, how long am I going to be with you and how long am I going to have patience with you? Bring him hither to me. Verse 18, and Jesus rebuked the devil and he departed out of him and the child was cured from that very hour. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Oh, devil. You think you're going to rob me of my faith in God? You think that old spirit of condemnation, you think that old spirit of guilt, you think that old spirit of lust, that old spirit of depression is going to take me out? Got news for you, devil. Wrong. You and what army? I've got resources available to me that you can't even dream of, devil. And as long as God is on my side, <laughs> who can be against me? Who? Glory to God. Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. The Apostle Paul writes, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things... We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, but pastor, you don't know what I've done. You don't know what I said. You don't know the sin I committed. Oh, the Lord is surely mad at me. The Lord is surely upset with me. Um, he knew you were going to believe and accept this gospel before you ever, going back to our primary text, before you ever were converted, before you were ever born, 
God knew that you were going to believe and accept this gospel. And the word of God tells us that those he did foreknow, he predestinated. What does that mean? Does that mean that God chose who was going to be saved before they were born? And he knew who was going to be saved and only those people were going to be saved. This is a Calvinist doctrine. It is wrong. Because it begins, predestination begins with the concept first of foreknowledge. God said, I know that Tommy is going to believe the gospel and he's going to obey and he's going to be baptized in Jesus' name. I know this. Therefore, I am sending Tommy up on a road for success. Before he has even come to me. I am already setting him on a road so that he is destined to that end. See, I know what kind of decision you would make. Regardless. So I'm going to go ahead and help you to make sure you get there. This is what Paul was saying today in our primary text. said, those he did foreknow, them also... He did predestinate. For whom he did foreknow. Chapter 20, uh, verse 29, Romans 8. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. This is why Paul said, What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He said, honey, listen, why in the world would you be afraid of anything? Why would you let the devil torment you and trouble you? God was working for you before you even knew him. Before you ever repented. Before you ever came to the cross. Before you ever came to a knowledge of this gospel. God had already predestined you for success. He already predestined you for salvation. Because he knew that even without his help, you would eventually come to that conclusion. Therefore, if God's been working for you, while you, the Bible said, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While you were still in sin, while you were still in unbelief, while you still were in false doctrine, while you still were in a false movement, God was already working on your behalf. Paul said, if this be true, then if God be for us, <laughs> who can be against us if God is working for you before you even know him then why in the world now that you know him why in the world would you not understand that there is nothing in this world that is going to separate you from his love and if you're not separated from his love I assure you you will never be separated from his help his mercy his grace his power. In Philippians 4, closing right now, verses 12 and 13, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Philippi, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. People love to quote that scripture out of context. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Oh, I've decided I'm going to start my own business. I've decided I'm going to marry this fella. I've decided I'm going to buy that house, bless God. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Meaning, they've come to the mindset that whatever they set their head on, they're going to be able to accomplish it because after all, Christ gives them the strength to do whatever they choose to do. Whatever they want to do. That is not the context in which Paul made this statement. Paul made this statement. He said, I know how to prosper and I know how to be poor. I know how to go hungry and I know how to have plenty. 
He said, in the end, I can do all things. In other words, I can endure whatever circumstance comes my way. Has nothing to do with you're making your mind up to do a certain thing. And bless God, because Jesus is there, you're going to be able to do it. That is a complete perversion of this text. We're going through... A difficult time right now with COVID. People are stuck for the most part in their homes. We're not able to go about and do the things we'd like to do. We're not able to go places we're accustomed to going. We're not able to live like we're accustomed to living. We've got Christians who are going and literally um, setting up plans to kidnap the governors of their state. And hold them accountable because, bless God, they're shutting down places and they're infringing upon our freedoms. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Um, idiot. Yeah, that's you. That's your name, idiot. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. This circumstance is a necessary circumstance. I can do it. Hello now. Now we've got a situation. A week ago we had a snowstorm. All of a sudden everything was, you talk about being shut down now, honey. It was really shut down. You couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't get out. All these fool people crabbing about, oh, bless God, our freedoms are being taken away. If your freedoms are being taken away, how were you able to be standing on the doorstep of the Michigan uh, State House with a gun in your hand right. in the middle of the day? Mm -hmm. How, If your freedoms were taken away from you, how was that possible? No, your freedoms weren't taken away, you ding that. You weren't able to do what you want to do, how you want to do it, when you want to do it. And all of a sudden, like a petulant baby, like an immature jackass, mm -hmm. you were going to whine and cry because you can't do everything the way you want to do it. Well, I got news for you, fool. In this life, there are often circumstances that come that limit what we're able to do and how we're able to do it. I've been to the hospital to see people who were severely burned. And I had, before I went in, that told me, they said, you got to put on these uh, pullover pants. you got to pull on this uh, uh, top. you got to put this on your head. you got to put this on your face. you got to wear these gloves. I mean, I was covered, Tommy. Every inch of my body was covered. The only thing that wasn't covered was my eyes. To go in and visit a man who had been severely burned. What am I going to do? Stand there and grab your time to take away my freedom. You're trying to take away my rights. No. I understood that that circumstance called for these precautions. It's no big deal. I'm a grown-up. I'm an adult. I'm not an idiot. I understand that there are times in life when certain circumstances call for certain precautions and you have to do things a certain way. Am I telling the truth? Yep. But we got a bunch of morons in America running around screaming and hollering about how their rights are being infringed upon, how their liberties are being infringed upon, how their freedom is being infringed upon. We have thousands of people marching up on the Capitol claiming that their freedoms were being taken away from them. Really? Then how are you free to travel to Washington, D.C.? How are you free to walk up on the Capitol, start breaking windows and tearing down doors, beating up police officers? How are you free to do all that? <coughs> Tommy and I often joke. He and I often joke we'll be out to try to do something. You know, if we eat out at all these days, we go through a drive through We, we literally uh, do not even walk into restaurants if we can help it, even to pick up our food. We'll go through a drive through We're on the highway, and the highway's loaded with cars. Thousands of cars. 
And he and I look at each other and say, boy, this shutdown sure has taken away everybody's freedom. Boy, I mean to tell you, this shutdown sure has taken away everybody's liberty. We drive past a hundred restaurants and a hundred restaurants have cars in the drive through hundred restaurants have people parked outside as employees are bringing out their food. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Folks, it's time that people in America wake up and stop being idiots and stop being stupid and foolish and start acting like believers. Amen. The word of God said, every circumstance that comes upon me, I can do it through Christ. Even if my liberties were infringed upon. Even if my freedom were taken away from me. Even if I wound up suffering persecution. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. The bottom line today is this. David knew to go up to Goliath and to challenge Goliath, understanding that he had a more powerful weapon in his arsenal than Goliath and the Philistines would ever have in theirs. He had the name of the Lord. He had faith in God. He had the word of God. Folks, I'm here to tell you today, when the enemy comes against you like a flood, the Word of God said that he will raise up a standard against him. Do you know what that means? Listen, when the enemy comes against you like a flood, God will cause the ground beneath your feet to rise so the waters will never overtake you. Hallelujah. You and what army? The devil's trying to beat you back when you're struggling with addiction, when you're struggling with bad habits, when you're struggling with temptation, when the enemy's trying to come against you with despair, when the enemy's trying to come against you with depression, when the enemy's trying to tempt you with lust, he's trying to tempt you with malice, hatred, envy, strife. These are all areas that demons work in. You can look that devil in the eye and say, Devil, you and what army? You hadn't got near enough in your arsenal to take my faith down. As long as I can take God at His word, as long as I can trust God and believe God to be faithful to His promises, then there is nothing in this world that you can do against me. If God be for us, who? can be against us. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon?